morning, church, and welcome to the last Sunday of two services. I'm sure the worship team in particular is overjoyed. Uh, starting at 7.30 in the morning is tough sometimes. And uh, also, as Victor mentioned, welcome to the uh, last Sunday before daylight savings. So if you accidentally forget to set your alarm and, or set your clocks back, you should be in good shape because um, if 11 o'clock, if you forget, will actually be 10 o'clock next week, so you'll be fine. Now, as you well know, we've been in a series in Acts uh, for quite a while, and much of the application in Acts is about boldly proclaiming the gospel. Narrative after narrative after narrative is uh, someone sharing the gospel, it seems. And we've seen Peter's sermons right out the gate after they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And what does he do? He goes and uh, preaches a sermon. In Acts 7, when Stephen, before Stephen is martyred, he's preaching. Philip is evangelizing Samaria in Acts 8. Peter is proclaiming the message of the gospel to the Gentiles, specifically Cornelius in Acts 10. Brothers are proclaiming the gospel to Jews and Gentiles in Acts 11. And they get to the point in Acts 13 of sending out missionaries. And as they go on their journey, these missionaries, what are they doing? They're preaching the gospel. And every Sunday, you could get into this trap of just same application, boldly proclaiming the gospel, boldly proclaiming the gospel. And pretty soon, you could feel guilty. Oh, well, I'm not doing a good job of that. And uh, so, or maybe you'd start zoning out. Well, we heard that last 17 times, and so I don't want to hear it again. But uh, it's an important theme that comes up in Acts, and I think what Luke does in these two chapters, and again, we'll focus primarily on 14 this morning, is he focuses on some of the nuances or the tangents of proclaiming the gospel, and hence the title this morning, Proclaiming the Gospel, Boldly Proclaim the Gospel Until It Hurts. I'm going to explain what that is through the sermon and what uh, Luke reveals in his text this morning. The other thing I want to say as well is, for reference, a lot of time has actually gone by in the book of Acts. And we kind of read this as if, oh, it's a few months, maybe uh, weeks, months, maybe a year or two. In reality, a lot more time has actually transpired. When Jesus ascends back in Acts 1, it's approximately AD 30, give or take a year or three. But when we reach Acts 12, Historically, we know that Herod died when, uh, in the year AD 44. So just from Acts 1 to 40, or 12 is uh, 14 years. And then when you get to Acts 15, which you won't be able to hear for quite a while as the churches do different things before they come back to Acts, the Jerusalem Council is actually in AD 49. And when you read this chapter here in 14... We're approximately AD 48, which means 18 years have gone by since we started the book. What does that tell us? They're still boldly proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ over 18 years. And that's, again, just right out the gate, an easy lesson for us to understand. We need to be boldly proclaiming the gospel. There's never a pause button. There's never a relax button. Faithfully, we need to be boldly proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. But in Acts 13 and 14, as I've mentioned, Luke highlights two principles. The good news for you today is it's only two points for the sermon instead of the typical three. The bad news is I'm still going to keep you really long. It doesn't make a difference in the length of the sermon. But Acts 13 and 14, I believe Luke highlights and clarifies a couple of principles that have been kind of lurking in the background, like in the back of your stove, and then they kind of get brought forward for us to really highlight. So this morning, I would invite you to use your personal printed or digital copies of the Bible, whether it's in English, Greek, Spanish, or in Russian. And we're going to work through these points together, beginning by reading the, uh, the section of the chapter, Acts 14, 1 through 20. So let's read this. In Iconium, they entered the Jewish synagogue as usual and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they stayed there a long time and spoke boldly for the Lord, who testified to the message of his grace by enabling them to do signs and wonders. But the people of the city were divided. Some siding with the Jews and others with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with the rulers to mistreat and stone them, they found out about it, and they fled to the Lycaonium towns of Lystra and Derbe, 
and to the surrounding countryside. And there they continued to preach the gospel. In Lystra, a man was sitting who was without strength in his feet, had never walked, and had been lame from birth. He listened as Paul spoke. And after looking directly at him and seeing that he had faith to be healed, Paul said in a loud voice, Stand up on your feet! And he jumped up, and he began to walk around. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted, saying in the Lyconian tongue, The gods have come down to us in human form! And Paul, Barnabas they called Zeus, Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the town, brought bulls and wreaths to the gates because he intended with the crowds to offer sacrifice. The apostles Barnabas and Paul tore their robes when they heard this and rushed into the crowd shouting, People, why are you doing these things? We are people also, just like you. And we're proclaiming good news to you, that you turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to go their own way, although he did not leave himself without a witness, since he did what is good by giving you rain from heaven and fruitful seasons and filling you with food and your hearts with joy. And even though they said these things, they barely stopped the crowds from sacrificing to them. And some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and when they had won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, thinking he was dead. And after the disciples gathered around him, he got up, went into the town, and the next day he left with Barnabas for Derbe. The first principle I want to put out of this context that we have here is connect with the listener when boldly sharing the gospel. The most effective results of sharing the gospel, according to the stats out there, are somewhere between 75 and 90% come to faith in Jesus Christ because friends and family. There's a relationship that's already built. While going door-to-door to evangelize has its place in street preaching and other forms of evangelism, good, effective evangelism typically is built on strong relationships. And Paul tries to establish a relationship with the people that he's ministering to and sharing the gospel with as an avenue to be able to best successfully share the gospel. And so that's what I want to focus on this morning is we need to connect with the people, the listeners that need to hear the gospel first before just jumping in and beating them over the head with the Bible. And you start to see this already in past passages in Acts 13. So if you go back just briefly in Acts 13, he connected with the Jews in Antioch and Pisidia. And what does he do there? He preaches based on common history. He's a Jew. The people in the synagogues are Jews. And so in verse 16 of chapter 13, he stands up and motions with his hand and says, fellow Israelites, there's a common ground, there's a rapport that he's building. And then he traces all the history through this passage and talks about how God chose the ancestors, Abraham, the patriarchs, and uh, pulls them out of Egypt, puts up with them 40 years in the wilderness, gives them the promised land, gives them a king when they desire, Saul. And later on in verse 22, he raises up David to be a man after his own heart who will carry out his will. So why does he start there? Because he's a Jew and they're a Jew. They both of them share that same history. They both were in school learning about their roots. And that's the identification point. And so when he comes in and he starts talking, that's how he identifies and the people can recognize, all right, we can listen to this guy. He's not too bad. They'll be eager to hear what else Paul is going to say and advance the gospel when it gets to a more difficult concept. So there's rapport established between the listener and the speaker. And that's something that we need to make sure that we're doing when we're sharing the gospel as well. How can we find common ground between me and this other person, whoever it is? The other thing that Paul does in this passage, and we're going to see again in Acts 14, is he contextualizes the gospel. Paul contextualizes the gospel. Now, half of you in this room just said, what does contextualize mean? And so I'm going to help you understand that a little bit this morning. But basically, 
you're trying to take what is truth, that doesn't change, the content doesn't change, and you're going to put it in a way that the un- listener can understand. And depending on their life circumstances, maybe their age, whatever it is, you have to adjust the way you communicate this to them so that the listener can understand. Now, let's just say, hypothetically, there are people in this church who aren't familiar with borscht. And let's just say some pastor in this church would use borscht as an illustration in his sermon. And he would say, you know, it's really dangerous for us not to invite people over to our house because all we have to offer them for food is borscht. Now, um, some of us uh, that don't have those kind of roots don't have the context to understand why that's actually a big deal. So I, I mean, some of the people in the church were a little confused why this was said from the pulpit and uh, had to be taken back to square one and what is borscht and uh, why would you not serve it to guests typically? And and so um, I, I mean, the other people that were confused about it uh, went over to the pastor's house and actually got to eat some of the borscht provided. And to get a better context to understand, okay, this is just a pot of soup with stuff thrown in it, and you don't serve this when you, as an elaborate meal for your guests. I get it. I understand the context of his statement in the sermon. I mean, the other people understand the context of that statement in the sermon now. So it was contextualized by helping me, I mean, the other people understand it. Now, as a parent with your three-year-old, you would do this with theological terms or the gospel as well. You don't jump into the deep complexities of theology with a three-year-old child. They can't handle the big terms like sovereignty of God, depravity of man, verbal plenary inspiration, hypostatic union. Okay, now I just confused some of you and you have no idea what I'm saying. I really feel bad for the translator trying to put this into another language on top of that with these big words. But the point is this, whereas as an adult, you are old enough to have the context to understand or be told how these terms are. You can understand what some of these theological things are. But for a young child, you'd have to contextualize it. So instead of saying the Bible is written by verbal plenary inspiration, you just might explain that God caused every word in the Bible to be written. And by the way, just in case you want to know, that phrase literally just means every single word in your Bible is God-breathed. And that was read in the scripture reading this morning in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So when Paul contextualizes here to this group in Antioch, he starts with a point that they understand. David is the king, and he wrote prophecies, and he's the ancestor of the coming Messiah. They all agree on that. What they don't agree with is who the, uh, the descendant is that would be the Messiah. And so that's where he gets them all up to that point. He doesn't have to explain who God is. They know who God is. They all agree on that. They don't have to explain what sin is. They already are there. They get it. They understand death. They get all the way up to David. And that's where he contextualizes the gospel. He says, that's the starting point. Now let me help you understand what's really going on. It's pointing toward Jesus as the Messiah. And then he continues on in that message there later on in Acts 13. He uses scripture to support it. And in Acts 13, 33, it says in the second psalm, and then in 35, he refers to the 16th psalm to point toward Jesus. John the Baptist pointed toward Jesus. So all that he's doing here is helping them to understand the message of the gospel, builds the common ground, and then finds out where they're at in their spiritual journey, and then he goes forward by his words. Now, the same thing happens actually in Acts 14. Acts 13 was primarily with Jews in the synagogue, but in Acts 14, he's connecting with Gentiles in Lystra. Now, Lystra, just so you know, there's a map up on the screen for this one here that you'll see. It's a map that you've seen many times before. And uh, hopefully you're getting used to it and learning the geography a little bit of the land. So you can see up in the upper left is Antioch. They were over there 
in chapter 13. They've moved on to Iconium, which is the first half of first part of Acts 14, and we'll come back to that in a second. And then Lystra and Derbe. And I was trying to figure out a way to remember this, and I discovered A-I-L, ale, like I'm sick, I'm ailing. And then D, you can just make it a past tense, ailed. So you have Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe all in a line there. And for Lystra in particular, you can see down there is the lower dot. It's about 100 miles away from Antioch. And so the distance there takes several days to get from there to there. And it's a small country town. It's a Roman military post. It's surrounded by mountains. And uh, that's a, just a little place where Paul decided to stop by on his journey. And now the story with this one's a little weird. And uh, we're going to go to verse 8 to start out. But he does find common ground. It takes a little while for us to see that in the text. And if you go back to 14 verse 8, you have a man who was sitting on the ground without strength in his feet. He'd never walked. He'd been lame from birth. Now, this isn't the first time we've come with, up to a lame guy. And back in chapter 3, Peter healed one as well. But what's he doing? He's sitting there, can't do anything else, and he listens as Paul speaks. Now, what is Paul speaking, by the way? Go back to verse 7. They are preaching the gospel. So he's sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, and for whatever reason, Paul, moved by the Holy Spirit, looks directly at him and says, stand up on your feet. He doesn't hesitate, jumps up, and begins to walk around. Now, Luke doesn't want to put this in here to get our focus on another cool miracle. That is great. That's wonderful. But we've already seen one like it before and had a sermon on that one before. The purpose of this is to give the context for what's coming. And the crowd just goes berserk. And you're reading this text and thinking, why are they doing this? But the crowds see that Paul, what had Paul done? They shouted, saying in their language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the time, town, brings in these bulls and wreaths to the gates. They're intending to, with the crowds to offer sacrifices. So you might be scratching your head, why in the world do these people think Paul and Barnabas are gods? Can I contextualize this for you? Put it in context. To most of you, this doesn't make any sense unless I explain the stories. And the commentaries say a whole lot of things about this, but it just so happens in our church that we have this guy named Byron who teaches Greek mythology. So I said, hey, Byron, just give me the story of what's going behind here because it's a, it's a legend that goes on. So Byron's responsible for this, and I'll give you the kind of the, the summary of what he shared with me. But legend has it that the gods, Zeus and Hermes, stopped by this area and were looking for people to feed them and house them. And, and they started with the wealthy houses out there. Hey, can we come over here, eat food, spend the night? They were asking for hospitality, but the people refused. And they go through everyone in the town, and no one takes them in. So the two gods go outside the city, and they find this elderly couple who were super hospitable. The couple, couple was offering all their food. They even were going to offer to kill their watch goose. I should explain that. Uh, normally, people have watch dogs. In this case, apparently, it was a watch goose. But the, they were going to kill their watch goose and everything. They were going to have this big feast. The gods wouldn't allow it. I said, no, you keep your goose. It can keep watch. But the couple did notice something really fishy going on with these gods. They would serve the wine... And they would be pouring it out and drinking, pouring it out. And the wine never went down. So the couple figured out, hey, maybe we're in the presence of gods. And they started getting a little freaked out, frightened. And then the gods say, we're going to execute judgment on the city because the city did not give us any hospitality. And so they tell the couple, hey, get out of here. We're going to damage the city. And so they go up and they leave. And the whole land is flooded. A little bit more than the landslide and the floods on I-5 this morning. But you get the idea. But their house is spared, becoming a beautiful marble temple of which they become priests and a priestess. Now, needless to say, this is a legend that's gone down the years. And the people of Lystra now know that if any gods come showing up, we need to take really good care of them. 
And so when a miracle shows up, this guy gets healed, what do they do? Ah, Zeus and Hermes, they came back. And so they just freak out. And so they go, and the priest is like, oh, we'll get the bulls. We're going to have this big feast sacrifice. We're going to be hospitable this time because we don't want our land flooded or destroyed again. That's the context of what goes on. That's why these people freak out. Now, Paul then has to find common ground with these people to start the gospel conversation. Do you see what he does here? They think they're gods. It's like, we are not gods. And that's the point of the common ground. Verse 15 is better translated in uh, the original. Men, why are you doing these things? We are men also. That's the common ground. Because the people, what do they think they are? They're gods. No, 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 no. We're not up here. You're down there. We're, we're the same. We're, we're both men together. We're all men together. That's the common ground. And they tried to explain that. Verse 18 says it's really tough for them to get it across. So they're just men. When you do miracles, apparently people think you have superpowers. So the common ground, again, is established as much as possible. And at that point, then when there's common ground, there's at least some level of relationship, then Paul begins to contextualize the gospel. Now, I want you to notice that he doesn't start at the same place he did with the Jews. The Jews, it was assumed they all knew who God was. They knew what sin was. They knew death. And they knew all these pieces of the puzzle. Paul, what does he do? He goes all the way back to the beginning. Who is God? Because obviously, they haven't figured it out yet. They're trying to make Barnabas and Hermes, or sorry, uh, Zeus and Hermes, Paul and Barnabas, the gods. So Paul has to go all the way back to square one with this group. Who is God? And he describes God in a very clear way, because that's where they're at in their spiritual journey. They can't figure out who God is. And in verse 15, it says, Men, why are you doing these things? We are men also, just like you. And we're proclaiming good news to you that you turn from these worthless things to the living God. Our God is alive. He's living. He's not dead like these, these mythological gods are. He who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. See, our God is the creator. He's alive, and he's the creator. Zeus and Hermes didn't create anything. God did. Our creator God created everything from which any other gods that were made up could even come from. And then finally, he talks about how this God is gracious. Our God is gracious. Although he did not, well, sorry, go back to 16. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to go their own way. Although he did not leave himself without a witness, since he did what is good by giving you rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling you with food and your hearts with joy. So our God's alive, our God is the creator, and he's gracious. He doesn't come in here and say, you bad, horrible, pagan heathens, what are you thinking? Wax them upside the head with the Bible and said, this is who God is. No, he takes the time to graciously explain who God truly is. And we don't know anything else about the gospel message. We don't see him ever in here get to Jesus Christ. Did you know that? We have no idea he, how, how far he got with this message of the gospel. But he went back to the starting point where they were at in their spiritual journey was, who is God? And he talks to them about God. We know stuff happens there because there's disciples. In verse 20, it says the disciples gather around him. Um, but there's an issue later. And we also know that Timothy uh, comes to faith in Christ as well because in Acts 16, we find out Timothy is from Lystra, where Paul has this message here. So fascinating how this works. He finds common ground with the listener. We are men, contextualizing the gospel. Hey, start with God here, because you don't know anything else past that. He does this in Athens as well, in chapter 17. They don't have a clear idea of who Jesus is. They probably never heard of him in their lives. But once again, he tries to find common ground. We are all religious. You're religious. I can see you worship gods. I'm religious. I worship a God. But again, he has to go back to the same starting point with the people of Athens. He sees an inscription on one of their monuments that says, to an unknown God. He said, guess what? 
I know who that is. And then he uses that as his starting point to contextualize the gospel. And off he goes, leading people to Christ. The reality is this, friends, we have many ways we can share the gospel. And there's all these kinds of methods out there. Some of you might have heard of the four spiritual laws. There's one that's the three circles, Romans Road. There's this organization called Evangelism Explosion. The reality is you can't just take one method and use that in every single case because it's not a one-size-fits-all. You look around your neighborhood, you look around your workplace, you look around your schools, wherever you're at. People are at different points in their spiritual journey, and you have to find some kind of common ground, and you have to figure out where they're at in their journey. Maybe you have to go all the way back to the beginning. Maybe they've got God figured out, but they don't have anything else. Maybe they come all the way up to Jesus, and that's where they're confused. So you have to figure out where to start your gospel message. With our children, the common ground is family. We brought you into this world, and we're going to share, you, share with you the gospel. We live together. And the contextualization is over time with your child. First, at some point, you establish this is God. And you didn't even give all the details about God. You just said God's in control. He's the one that's uh, over all things. Um, very, very, very early, you explained what sin was with your young child. And then death, if you keep doing this, no. Um, and then Jesus, who Jesus is, why he did what he did. But at times, you just say, all right, this is enough. And the kid's looking around, not focusing. You pause the conversation. But you're building steps, building blocks in the gospel message, wherever they're at in their spiritual journey. If you come across a person, for example, who believes in evolution, what's your common ground? It's the creation how it got there is a different story, but you can both appreciate the amazing creation that's out there, especially in fall, the beautiful leaves of the trees, how they fall to the ground, how all the creation is put together is where you have to contextualize because they would say it evolved over many billions of years. You say, no, God created this. He's the one, and that can be the launching part because generally evolutionists don't really hold to who God is, so you have to go all the way back to God. With your Jewish friends, you have a common ground of the Hebrew Scriptures. By the way, don't call the uh, Old Testament the Old Testament in front of a Jew. That will alienate them. There's no Old and New Testament. There's just the Bible for them, and it's just the Hebrew Scriptures. But you both read that. You read that, the Jew reads that. So at that point, you can say, hey, this is what we have in common. I believe in Abraham too, David too. But when you get to Isaiah 53, for example, then you have a launching point to go into who Jesus is. And he is the Messiah. With your Jehovah Witness or Mormon friends, you can always use the same translation of the whole Bible, and they'll be okay with that. They might try to add to it or say the words are translated differently. But even with them, you can find theology you can agree on, except when you get to the character of Jesus Christ, the battleground of the deity of Christ is where you're going to have to work with them. So wherever people are at in their spiritual journey, then you launch in to the conversation. You get the idea. You got to find the common ground, whatever it is. Common hobbies, maybe it's common sports, maybe it's common cars, like you just bought a Lexus and now you have somebody else to hang out with because you got this nice fancy car. Maybe it's sports, you name it, you put it in. But you can figure out a way to have a common ground and then you start assessing where they're at spiritually so you can contextualize the gospel. And you might not get all the steps of the gospel in in one time. But I want to very clearly remind all of us this morning, remember, God is the one who saves the person, not you. So you just be led by the Holy Spirit, figure out where they're at, go as far as you can, and let God take care of the rest. So principle number one is we need to find wise ways to connect with the listener when we're sharing boldly sharing the gospel. And the second principle is this. Continue to boldly share the gospel when opposed. Continue to boldly share the gospel when opposed. Up into Acts, there's been a lot of opposition. And the first part of it that I want to put out there today is when verbally opposed because of the gospel, sometimes you got to stay and keep proclaiming to the same audience. Nothing changes. And that's clearly what happened 
in the first two, few chapters of Acts. In, in Acts 2, for example, when they are filled with the Holy Spirit, people think they're already drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. You guys are smashed and you're saying weird things. No, 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 no. We're, we're fine. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. And even though they're verbally opposed and mocked at that point, what does Peter do? He says, all right, guys, I'm going to preach the message, the gospel of salvation. Acts 4, Peter and John are put in jail. They're commanded not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus at all. Don't say that stuff. The religious leaders threaten them, but they couldn't find any basis to punish them, so they released them. So verbal opposition there, no harm done to their bodies at all. They go back to the disciples, praise God, and guess what the next step they do is? They go back out there, preach to the same people, and share the gospel some more. Acts 5, the apostles are put in jail by the high priest. But an angel opens the gates of the prison and tells them to get out there and speak the gospel, which they do. So verbal opposition sends them to jail, and God sends his angel to kick them out of jail and keep preaching the gospel. Boldly proclaim the gospel, no matter what. So already we can see that thus far, when verbally opposed, the pattern is that the speakers go right back to that area and continue to give out the gospel. Let's return to our text in Acts 14. Now, the first three verses are thus. In Iconium, they entered the Jewish synagogue as usual and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. And so they stayed there a long time and spoke boldly for the Lord, who, was, who testified to the message of his grace by enabling them to do signs and wonders. Now again, there's a map on the screen that you can see where Iconium is. And it's 90 miles, 90 miles not meals, that would be tasty, 90 miles southeast of Antioch by the Sebastian Way. It's a plateau, it's elevated, it's strongly Hellenized. So it's uh, pretty far. You can see then that that means Iconium and Lystra are probably only 10 miles apart from each other, really close. So again, that's the context of where we're at on the map. When they go to Iconium, they go back into a Jewish synagogue, as usual, spoke in such a way. What way is that? Finding common ground. They're all Jews. And they also contextualize, not only for the Jews, but Greeks, because many of them came to know Christ. But what happens as a result? Unbelieving Jews stir up the minds of the Gentiles, persuading them, poising them against the brothers. So presumably, without much jumping around, we can know that they said, hey, this stuff that these uh, uh, so-called Jews are telling us about Jesus, all wrong. So the Jews tell the Gentiles, don't believe that stuff. All you need to do is get circumcised, follow the law, do this, that, the next thing. So they're poisoning the mind. They're speaking against the message of salvation. Did you catch what Paul and his crew do? Verbally opposed, what's well, the thing that they do? They stay there a long time and speak boldly for the Lord. They keep proclaiming the gospel message in the face of verbal opposition. They don't stop. And they speak, uh, and the Lord testifies by his grace, even adding signs and wonders through their hands. Paul and Barnabas just keep talking, keep saying Jesus, keep presenting the gospel. And I think there's a point here that Luke is indicating that packing up and leaving when there's resistance isn't necessarily the answer. Just because you don't like the resistance that people have in the liberal state of Washington doesn't mean you pack up your bags and move to another conservative state where it's comfortable and easier, more like-minded people. You don't need to change jobs just to, because somebody doesn't like the fact that you're a Christian and speak about Christ. You don't even need to move out of your neighborhood, even though there may be people there that don't like the gospel. You keep proclaiming the gospel, even if it's resisted. There can be, however, a change that can be made. Sometimes when you keep speaking to the same person, they keep resisting, they don't want to hear the message over and over and over again. But we see there's another thing that goes on throughout Acts, but sometimes when verbally opposed because of the gospel, sometimes you stay there, but you change the audience. So you stay in the same place, but change the audience. So instead of doing this group that's always resistant, fine. I'm not going to try to get you to Christ with a debate. I'm going to move over to this group over here who might be more willing. 
And the pattern is later on in Acts. You can see on the screen there, Acts 18, 6, which says, when they resisted, and these are the Jews in the town of Corinth, when they resisted and blasphemed, Paul shook out his clothes and told them, your blood is on your own heads. I'm innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. What he does is, is he stays in the city, but instead of doing this Jewish audience who doesn't want to hear the gospel, he goes over to the Gentiles. And interestingly enough, later on, in chapter 18, verse 10, it says, God says to him in a night vision, I am with you and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you because I have had many people, I have many people in the city. And Paul stays there a whole year and a half. There's verbal opposition from the Jews, but he doesn't go anywhere. Different audience now, but he sticks around proclaiming the gospel. In Acts 19, 9, happens again. When some people, he goes into the synagogue, it says in verse 8, in Ephesus. In verse 9, when some became hardened and would not believe, slandering the way in front of the crowd, he withdrew from them, taking in the disciples, taking the disciples, sorry, and conducted discussions every day in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. So he said, all right, Jews, you don't want to hear it? Fine. I've spoken to you enough. Now let's find some other people that I can speak the gospel to and share the message of salvation. Paul recognizes you don't beat a dead horse. If people are resistant, don't spin your wheels trying to get the one person who doesn't want to listen. Find people that do want to listen. So if you got a next door neighbor, that old curmudgeon over there, maybe it's time to go to the other side of the house and start working on the people next door. Maybe at work, you got that one person that's just resistant, maybe find somebody else. Coworkers, students at school, families, you know who they are. We might have to shift because trying to debate someone to Christ is nearly an impossible task. But the point of this is, no matter what situation where you have, stay in this place and you have the same audience, stay in the place of a different audience, the one universal principle is keep boldly proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. The next part of this is, though, on, on this, is when physically persecuted on account of the gospel, flee to another audience if possible. This one took me off guard. I did not see this one coming. Because generally, I think we think of, oh, these martyrs, they're spiritual people, and they totally are. They are killed for their faith, and we revere them. But in Acts, something odd happens with Paul. Every single time that he is threatened with physical harm or his life or the actual physical harm happens to him, every single time he flees. I didn't see that one coming. It is not on us to search for persecution. If it comes, fine. But we are, it seems like in this pattern, free to leave physical persecution. Not the verbal, but physical. Let me just show you through a few texts in Acts, or just read it for you. In Acts 1, sorry, Acts 8, verse 1, persecution causes the Christians to be scattered. But when scattered, what do they do? They preach the word of God in 8, 4. And Paul's persecution involved breathing threats, murders, and permission. So it's very clear these people lives, people's lives were at stake, and they fled. And that seems fine to do in God's eyes. You remember Saul himself, Paul, in Acts 9.23. The Jews plotted to do away with Saul in Damascus, but the disciples lured him out the window, and off he takes off. And what does he do? He goes straight to Jerusalem, keeps preaching the gospel. And later on in that chapter, Acts 9, 29, and 30, the Jews in Jerusalem didn't like what he's doing. They attempted to kill him. He finds out, what does he do? The brothers send him off to Tarsus. Get out of here. Acts 11, those who were, who were scattered as a result of the persecution, same persecution all the way back with Stephen. They go to Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, speaking the gospel. Acts 12, Herod lays his hands on some who belong to the church in order to mistreat them. James was put to death. He did not escape the persecution, and he was put to death. He was a martyr, just like Stephen. Herod said, hey, this is great. People like this. The Jews love this, and they arrest Peter, and guess what God does? God helps him flee persecution. Angel comes in the middle of the night, releases him out of prison, and what does he do? He leaves the area and continues to go on preaching the gospel. 
And then Acts 13, just before our text this morning, the Jews in Antioch in verse 44 were really mad. In verse 45, the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy, began to contradict what Paul was saying to them, was saying, insulting him. So there's verbal opposition in Acts 13, 45. What do they do? They stay. Paul and Barnabas boldly replied, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you, Jews, first. Since you reject it, judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. We're turning to the Gentiles. We're going to stay here. You're just verbally attacking us. We're, we're not going anywhere, but we're going to change the audience. And the Gentiles were ecstatic. The Jews, in verse 50, were still mad. In verse 50, the Jews inside of the prominent God-fearing women and the leading men of the city, they stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their district. At that point, Paul and Barnabas realize it's getting real. The physical harm is coming. And Paul and Barnabas shake the dust off their feet and went on to Iconium. And what do they do? Verse 14, they speak the gospel. And that's where, again, in our text, we've already revealed there that in the first three verses, it says they were verbally abused. Their minds, the Jews poisoned the mind of the Gentiles. And the people, in verse 4, of the city were divided, some siding with the Jews and others with the apostles. And then in verse 5, when an attempt was made both by the Gentiles and the Jews with the rulers to mistreat and stone them, guess what they do? They found out about it and flee. And they head off to Lystra and Derbe to the surrounding countryside. So they get out of there. When they realize their life is at stake, they leave. And guess what they're doing? Verse 7. They continued preaching the gospel. Verbal opposition doesn't stop them. Physical harm doesn't stop them. They continue to preach the gospel. Same thing in Lystra too. We've already talked about that story about the weird things. They call them gods and whatnot. And they had trouble stopping them, the crowds, from sacrificing to them in verse 18. But then go down to verse 19 to finish the text. Some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. Now that's substantial. That means people from chapter 13 and the first part of chapter 14 are coming down to take them out. Even 100 miles away, they hate this message. With then, what they do is they went over the crowds. They stoned Paul. Paul doesn't get out of there fast enough. Dragged him out of the city thinking it was dead. But catch what happens next. After the disciples gathered around him, he gets up, goes into town, and the next day, he leaves with Barnabas and Derbe. And I'm going to cheat and go to verse 21. And they preached the gospel in that town. Any questions? If you haven't figured out to boldly proclaim the gospel, no matter what situation, through this whole series, that is the goal. Share the gospel. And in this case, it seems like if people are going to physically attack you, which again in our culture isn't going to probably happen, get out of there. I can give you three more. Acts 16. They're beaten by the people, thrown into the jail. Paul and Silas, they lead the jailer to Christ. That's the whole one where they're singing at midnight and the uh, jail, there's an earthquake. But if you read the rest of that text, they were released the next day. They head out of the city. Where do they go? Next city, Thessalonica. The Jews in Thessalonica in Acts 17 form a mob. They can't find Paul, drag Jason out, and they beat him up. Guess what Paul does? Leaves for Berea, next city. You don't want to hear the message? I'm moving on. Jews from Thessalonica chase him down to Berea. Guess what Paul does? Moves. Keeps preaching the gospel the whole time. Acts 18, I already told you about the one and a half years in Corinth. But at some point at the end of one and a half years, Sosthenes gets beaten up. Guess what Paul does? Leaves. I could not believe this when I saw this in the text. Repeatedly, Paul constantly tries to flee persecution. How do you apply this to our lives? Well, obviously verbal persecution or verbal opposition is one where we have to stay strong preaching the gospel. But I doubt any of us here in our context in Whatcom County are going to experience physical persecution that would cause us to consider actually fulfilling this. I do, however, want to acknowledge, but some of you here in this room are likely here because of religious persecution in your family around the world years ago. 
So some of you understand far better than I do, which also means you understand firsthand or secondhand persecution still exists in the world today. And the last thing I want to put up there today is when others are physically persecuted on account of the gospel, pray. Pray. What about those that have fled but are struggling to get by? What about those who can't flee the persecution? They don't have the finances. Maybe they are so watched by the government and their families, they're not allowed to flee. You know what they tell you? Pray. You'll see a lot of stats on the screen. And why I did this is because next Sunday, November 3rd, is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. This is an annual Sunday that many Christian organizations, including Open Doors, Voice of the Martyrs, International Christian Concern, and the International Mission Board, to just name a few, they use this day to bring to our attention our suffering brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world. Let the stats sink in. One out of every seven Christians are persecuted worldwide. That is over 365 million Christians who suffer high levels of persecution in the world every single day. One in five Christians are persecuted in Africa. That's 20%. In Asia, it's 40%, two out of every five. 4,998 Christians were killed for faith-related reasons last year alone. And that's an average of 13 Christians every single day. 14,766 churches and Christian properties were attacked last year, and nearly 300,000 Christians were displaced in 2023 as well. These are brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world. And all they want from us here in the Western world is to pray for them. Pray for these dear saints that in the face of physical persecution, they would be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Pray that they will not recant their faith. Pray that they would love, forgive, and bless their persecutors. Pray that the persecutors would relax their anger against the gospel. Pray that the persecutors would come to faith in Christ. But pray for our dear brothers and sisters suffering for their faith around the world. Just some application questions this morning for us, just four of them. First one, how are you connecting to the people that God has placed in your life by finding common ground? Common hobbies, common sports, common work, common foods, common cars, you fill in the blank, common flowers, I don't know what it is. How are you connecting with people so you can get to the point of then contextualizing? Number two, how are you actively discovering where people are at spiritually that God has placed in your life so you can contextualize the gospel? Okay, they understand. They've got a good idea of who God is, but they don't understand sin. Or they've gotten all this way, and I can start here. Or I've got to go all the way back to the beginning. But develop redemptive relationships with people. Find out where they're at spiritually. And then you can have a good starting point to share the gospel wherever they're at and their spiritual understanding. Number three, how are you actively sharing the gospel even if verbally opposed by people that God has placed in your life? Maybe it's with them and you've got to say, I'm going to keep going because I don't have a sense to move on. Maybe God's saying, you're done with this one. Let's go on to a different person, different audience. How are you actively sharing the gospel? And then finally, this passion of my heart this morning, how will you intentionally and regularly play, pray for your persecuted brothers and sisters suffering for the gospel all around the world? They just want prayer. Can you find a few seconds each day to bring them before the throne of God and pray for our brothers and sisters? Proclaim the gospel until it hurts. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you for this text. Thank you for the chapters in Acts. We've covered a lot of ground. We focused a little bit on Acts 14. But I pray this morning that you would help us to understand the importance of connecting with the listeners with the gospel. We just don't go up to people and start bashing them on the head with a Bible. That doesn't get them saved. Help us to work toward establishing relationships to be able to find common ground, figure out where they're at spiritually, contextualize the gospel for them for wherever they're at.
And God, when the opposition comes, help us to know what to do. When it's verbal, help us to stay, to stand strong, to be steadfast and movable. But if it ever comes to physical persecution, help us to know when to leave. And most importantly this morning, we do pray for brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. God, this morning I pray that you would help them stand strong. Persecution's coming physically. Some of them are already in jail. Some of them might be beaten this moment. Thirteen of them will lose their lives today. God, I pray that you'd keep them strong to fight to the end to live for the faith until their dying seconds. And God, we do pray for the persecutors that they would see a radical difference in their life, their testimony, and that you might bring some of them to Christ. We pray as well that you would release them from being persecuted, that the persecutors would give up and move on. We pray that you would even change government laws and family practices so these people would not be persecuted anymore, that they would be able to be free to worship you, praise you, to share your gospel, and boldly proclaim the message. For all of us here this morning, help us to continue, no matter what the situation, to boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ until it even hurts. In Jesus' name, amen.